In the last video, we looked at the k-bit counter. The worst case cost of an increment in terms of the number of flips was big O of k, because we might have to flip every single bit. However, if we predicted from the very beginning that each increment would take two bit flips, Sometimes for an individual operation we'd overestimate the cost, sometimes for an individual operation we'd underestimate the cost. But when you look at the total cost of bit flips that we would uh, incurred since the beginning of the program, we would end up with a number that was greater than or equal to the actual number of bit flips. This led to a notion of what we called amortized cost. We predicted that the total cost would be 2 times n, and the actual cost, while always increasing, sometimes increased slowly because of a series of cheap operations, and then jumped up because of an expensive operation. However, it didn't look like the actual cost ever crossed the predicted line. In order to understand why that's the case, we're going to want to concentrate not on the red line or the green line, but on the difference between them. If we look at the difference between the two lines, then we end up with a graph that sometimes is growing and sometimes is shrinking, but that always is staying above zero. When the difference between the predicted and actual values is very large, then we say that we can afford to do an expensive operation, like an increment that has to turn a large number of ones to zeros. When the difference is very small, then we would say that we can't afford to do an expensive operation and we'll need to do some cheaper operations in order to store back in our reserves so that we can afford a future expensive operation. This notion of cheapness or affordability is an important part of how we think about amortized analysis. We can think about this line as representing our savings over time. When we're at a peak in the graph, we have a lot of savings. And when we're at a trough in the graph, we have fewer. So we'll need to go into saving mode. So when we're doing amortized analysis, we're requiring that the expensive operations are paid for always in advance by the cheap operations. We won't allow ourselves to take out a loan. The amount of savings we have always has to be positive but it can grow larger or smaller with time. We've seen this table before. This is the actual number of bit flips over a series of eight increments versus the predicted number of bit flips if we predict two flips per operation. If we record the difference between these two numbers at each point, which remember we're thinking of as our savings, or our reserve, we just do this by subtraction. Initially, both numbers are zero, so the difference is zero. Then it's one, one, six minus four is two, one, two, Two, and then right before the most expensive operation I do, I end up with a savings of three, which then goes down back to one after I perform the operation. The next trick is an important one. We're going to think about measuring this difference in tokens, which is just to say that when I have a difference of two, I'm going to call that two tokens. And when I have a difference of three, I'm going to call that 
three tokens. A token represents a bit flip that I've budgeted for, in other words, that I've predicted, but that I haven't yet actually gone through with and done. This gives us the idea of spending a token. We spend a token when we perform a flip that we already paid for when we performed a previous operation. Before we talk more about spending tokens, we're going to want to talk about the relationship between th these numbers, which are our savings, and these patterns of bits, because it turns out there's a very useful pattern. At each point in this table, the number that we've recorded here is the exact same as the number of one bits, which means that instead of drawing our three tokens outside of our structure, we can draw those three tokens right on top of the one bits. Same here. And in fact, if we do this everywhere, just annotating a one bit with a token everywhere, then all of our diagrams contain the same number of tokens that we described on the left. This is a really important observation because it allows us to think about invariants, which are, as we know, how we go about proving anything. The invariant that we're going to describe is that whenever we have a one digit in our k-bit counter, we're going to have exactly one token associated with that. So without having to think operationally about how I got from the beginning of time to a particular counter, I can look at the counter containing 110110 and I know how many tokens I need to have in reserve. I need to have four. Similarly, this bit pattern, which represents the number 32, needs to contain exactly one token. And this bit pattern needs to contain three. If this is our invariant, we have to establish that it's true initially and preserved by every increment operation. Is it true initially? Well, sure. Initially, we don't have any tokens but we also start with the counter that has value zero, which means we're in good shape. What's more interesting is to talk about how this invariant is preserved. Because we want to describe the amortized cost of a single increment operation as being two flips, we're going to say that we get two new tokens whenever we perform an increment operation. So as a simple example, let's talk about the counter containing one, zero, zero, one, one, one which when we flip is going to turn to one, zero, one, zero, 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 because we, and we will have had to flip four bits. If we look at what this counter looks like before the flip, we're going to have a token attached to every one in the counter. We're best, uh, we're best with just leaving this uh, token that's attached to the one that doesn't change alone. Whenever we don't change a bit, we're just going to try to pass its token to the subsequent data structure unchanged. For the rest of the flips, well, all of the ones that we'd had to change to zeros, we can pay for with the stored tokens that were already associated with that ones. And because we get two new tokens when we perform the increment, we're going to use one of these two tokens to flip the zero to a one, and we're going to use the other token to restore the data structure invariant because this new one that we've added to the data structure needs a token associated with it. All of the ones that we flipped to zeros are now zeros. We spent a token to flip that bit, but now we don't need the token anymore. This is an instance of a general pattern. Every time we have a counter that we're about to increment, we're going to have some digits that won't be changed and some tokens that are stored in those digits, followed by a zero, followed by some number of ones possibly zero ones, in which case we just have the counter that looks like this. But possibly one one, possibly two ones, possibly more. In this case, we had three ones. And in each of these cases, because we're performing an increment operation, 
we're going to carry through all of the ones, turning them all into zeros, and turn a single zero into a one, leaving the rest of the bits completely unchanged. If there are no leading one bits, we just turn a single zero to a one. In both of these cases, we don't care about any tokens that are associated with the bits that don't change. We just go ahead and move those into the new data structure. We know that beforehand, by our data structure invariant, each of the one bits that we're going to flip is going to have a token attached to it, which means that we can flip that one bit to a zero, and that will be paid for by the tokens that were already in the data structure. There'll also be a single zero bit that we'll need to change to a one bit, and we'll pay for that in both cases by using one of our newly allocated tokens. The other newly allocated token goes to restoring the data structure invariant, because now that we've flipped a zero to a one, we have a one in our resulting data structure, and that one needs to have a token that's associated with it. Back to our graph picture. Again, we had a predicted cost for a series of operations, and we observed that the actual cost never seemed to rise above the predicted cost. The way that we've proved that in this video is that we've come up with a new measure, the total actual cost plus the total number of tokens stored in the data structure. We've proven that the actual cost plus the number of tokens is always going to be equal to the predicted cost. Now, if you were paying careful attention on this slide, you may have noticed I pulled a little bit of a fast one. There is one other case. There's the case where all of the bits in the counter are a one, which means that they all have tokens associated with them by the data structure invariant. If we do an increment operation on this counter, which means that we get two new tokens, we're going to need to turn all of those ones into zeros. But we can pay for all of these ones to be flipped to zeros using just the tokens that are already stored in the data structure. Now we've restored our data structure invariant. There are no ones in the resulting data structure, so we need no new tokens. So what do we do with the two newly allocated tokens? Well, we can just get rid of them. It's not required that we use all of the tokens that we reserve with every operation. And if we think in terms of our graph, what that means is that when we throw away tokens, the accumulated predicted cost is going to become bigger over time than the actual cost plus the number of tokens. But that's okay because we still have a data structure invariant that allows us to establish that the actual cost is going to remain lower than the predicted cost. So that's amortized analysis. Why do we do amortized analysis? We do amortized analysis when we have some very expensive operations that we have to do, but we want to prove that those expensive operations could effectively be paid for by the cheap operations that we'd done previously. How did we do amortized analysis? We did amortized analysis in four steps. First, we invented a notion of token which gave us a currency with which to say that we were paying for expensive later operations with cheaper operations earlier on. Second, we assigned a cost to every operation. In this case, we said that every increment operation needed to have a budget of two new flips that we might have to perform or reserve so that we could perform later. Three, we came up with a data structure invariant for the counters, which said that for any counter, we could establish how many tokens that counter needed to have. Finally, we said that the data structure invariant was preserved by every increment operation, because every time I increment, those two new tokens, plus the tokens that are in reserve, are enough to both perform all of the bit flips that I need to do right now, plus restore the data structure invariant, ensuring that I'll have all the tokens I need to perform 
uh, increments later on.